All right, hello everybody and welcome to our Family History Roundtable panel discussion, Getting Family Involved in Your Research. I'm Kathleen McKenzie, Education and Programming Manager here at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society, and I will be moderating today's discussion. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history, and we're pleased to offer such pro programming for our members and friends around the world. This program today is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. Now, as genealogists, we all understand how fascinating family history research can be, especially when you break down a brick wall or make an exciting discovery. So naturally, our family members must be eager to get involved in our research and hear all about our discoveries, right? Uh, well, unfortunately for most of us, finding ways to get our relatives interested in family history is almost as much of a challenge as the research itself. So in this panel discussion, our genealogists will discuss their tips for getting family involved in your research. We have 45 minutes reserved for the panel, panel discussion, and then we'll have time for audience questions at the end. At any point during the discussion, please type your questions into the Q&A panel found at the bottom of your screen. There is no handout for today's discussion, but we are recording this program, and starting later today, you can go back and freely review the discussion. Our panelists today are Chief Genealogist David Allen Lambert and our Senior Genealogists Rhonda R. McClure and Melanie McComb. David has been on the staff of NEHGS since 1993 and has published many articles in the New England Historical and Genealogical Register and several other publications, as well as the book A Guide to Massachusetts Cemeteries. His areas of expertise include New England and Atlantic Canadian records, military records, DNA research, and Native American and African American genealogical research in New England. Rhonda joined the staff of NEHDS in 2006, and prior to that, she ran her own genealogical business for 18 years. In addition to numerous articles, she is the author of 12 books, including the award-winning Complete Idiot's Guide to Online Genealogy, and she is also the editor of the recently released sixth edition of the Genealogist's Handbook for New England Research. Her areas of expertise include immigration and naturalization, late 19th and early 20th century urban research, New England, German, Italian, and much more. Melanie is an international lecturer who presents on a variety of topics, including colonial through 20th century American military research, genetic genealogy, Atlantic Canadian, African American, Jewish, and Irish genealogy. She's had articles published in American Ancestors Magazine and 50 Plus Advocate. All right, so let's go ahead and welcome our panel on screen. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you. Hello. Hello. How's everybody doing? <laughs> All right, so um, so let's get started here. So um, as we've mentioned, we all know that it can be quite the challenge to get family interested in our research. Um, and I'm sure many of us have binders and online trees full of information that are fascinating to us, uh, but it might be a bit much to kind of pull out at a family party. Um, so I'm curious what strategies that you've all used to share your research findings with family members, or maybe you've kind of observed others um, employing different strategies. Um, so David, why don't you um, get us started here? Sure. Well, I mean, for holiday parties, I would drag out the family charts. I've been doing genealogy since I was a kid, so I think I was probably boring them to death. But you would find that during the course of the year, a cousin would contact me and say, my son or daughter has a genealogy project that's due tomorrow. Can you send me everything on the family tonight? And this is in the days before the internet. So when Facebook came about, um, I noticed a lot of people had groups, you know, like family reunions for like, you know, maybe the descendants of a set of grandparents. So I thought, why not create a family homestead, which I did. So my paternal and maternal, I created two groups. So my dad's parents and all of the related cousins of my father and generations earlier could basically log in and I could scan photos. I could put the, the stories up there every so often. I'll 
any HS says Vita Brevis, I have my own sort of Vita Brevis, if you will, for family members. I'll talk about an ancestor or I'll bring up something I find in my research that I have just recently discovered or something I did years ago that I thought they'd find fascinating. And I put it on there and, you know, they can log in, they can comment, they can share the best part, they can download. And I don't have to gather up this information and prepackage it. Now, that's not to say that if any family member was interested in having a chart or copies of things a little bit more in depth. I mean, the internet, putting something on one drive or just putting it on a thumb drive and sending it to I'm more than happy to because I believe our family history research shouldn't be just stored with us. I mean, I think we need to share it. I mean, in safety and numbers, especially with natural disasters that happen, you don't want to be the sole person with all that information. Um, and, you know, maybe your intention is to publish a book. So you want to be very private on the information. Well, you can always do an appendix to that book. So I always say, share what you have now, maybe even start a group like Facebook, or uh, even the simplest thing, a round robin letter for the holidays, but maybe include an ancestor picture in there or a story of one. Uh, I know for myself, uh, I'm sort of like the, the cobbler and the children who were the cobbler, the cobbler's children who had no shoes. Uh, I shared my family history with uh, my my brother, and it was basically just printouts of of the you know multi generational charts and the family group sheets. And I happened to visit him and his wife one one particular ho holiday, and he's like, "What's the deal?" He's like, "My wife's got all of this really lovely like like really fancy kind of book and everything, and you give me just printouts." Uh, so, uh, but my favorite thing is to always have it on my phone, and that way, you know, they never know when I'm going to pull out that family tree and start talking about somebody. I've used a couple of different techniques that are a mixture of what David and Rhonda shared in terms of uh, using Facebook, but instead of in groups, I would actually use it as just my own Facebook to share with family members um, different findings. So either I would do a sketch on an ancestor, or most recently, I would even try to connect maybe an ancestor or close relative to a family recipe that I put together. So, I mean, something going back to, you know, a different holiday at St. Patrick's Day, I always make like Irish soda bread scones and I would share information about my great grandmother who, uh, who, who had actually had come, who had come from Ireland and had that recipe passed down. And we showed how we kind of, you know, taken the original recipe and then how we adapted it for our current use. So that was kind of like a more modern way of just sharing a way to, you know, do something kind of festive, um, but still share a little tidbit in there of information. Yeah, I love that. Definitely a really engaging way to to kind of get people involved. Um, so it occurs to me that that would be a great thing for kids. Um, any other recommendations for maybe getting kids involved in family history? Uh, so personally, myself, um, I've done a couple of things. One time uh, I was kind of shocked to discover that I was going to have to give a lecture that was going to include uh, a bunch of adults, but also teenagers. Uh, and it was sort of something that I didn't find out really about until I got to where I was going. I was like, how am I going to like, you know, keep this interesting for the kids? Uh, and so what I ended up doing for that particular talk was I incorporated some underwater photograph that I that I had taken while scuba diving off of Key West uh, to show a sunken uh, passenger liner. And, uh, you know, talk to, the, you know, it came up and the kids are like looking at it. And I said, you know, what it was. And I said, oh, by the way, you don't see it in this particular picture. I said, but there was a, a shark swimming to the right of me. And so that sort of kept them going to see what else I might pop up. Uh, for my own kids though, uh, in the, I think it was the same year that we were, that I, was uh, scuba diving, uh, I also took my 12 year old daughter with me to the Key West Cemetery. Uh, she didn't wanna go out with her dad on the boat that day. So I was like, oh great, you know, we're gonna be there five minutes, she's gonna complain, we're gonna have to leave, but I, I wanna be there and I needed to do stuff. And she spent the whole day there with me. Uh, I was actually uh, looking for uh, various insignias for fraternal groups and uh, other religious uh, organizations and Key West only has the one cemetery. So you get like the Catholics, you've got the Jewish, and then you've got the, the general uh, 
area. So we spent the whole day there and, uh, you know, had a ball. She like was cleaning off graves, especially of the little kids. And she was probably the only 12 year old I know who knew the, the group Knights of Pythias. Uh, but when we got back to the marina that after that, that the, you know, it was, I think, six o'clock that night and everybody's like oh what'd you do today and she just puffed up her little chest and she's like we spent the day in the cemetery and I literally watched everybody that was there asking what we'd done step back uh but she was thrilled by it and to this day you know she's super respectful in cemeteries and when she got her first digital camera we had to go to a cemetery to take pictures and so that was sort of how she like she equates that respect of their final resting place as something really, really important. And she's been the one that's been most involved in the genealogy. You know, for me, I have two daughters. And um, for, as a kid, for me, I was home school one day and uh, my grandmother got a book brought back from my uncle that she, he had borrowed. And I took the book off the table being curious and I noticed there was a metal photograph inside. And this photograph really intrigued me. I, I asked my grandmother, I said, Nan, who's this? And she said, this is my grandfather. This is my father. This is your great grandfather. And I thought to myself, I said, I've never met him before. And the idea that, you know, that at seven years old, we lost a goldfish. So I didn't know he could be living in the next state. Uh, and then she started to tell me a little bit about it. But what she caught my attention was, again, the story. Um, he was on a whaling ship. And, you know, we had just learned a child-friendly version of Moby Dick where the whaler and the whale became friends. So the idea that my great-grandfather could have been friends with a whale was really cool to a seven-year-old. <laughs> um, fast forward to becoming a dad and having my own children. Um, I lost my parents um, fairly early. My oldest daughter was uh, only a toddler at the time. And I would read her bedtime stories. And um, one time she asked me when she was about four years old, she says, tell me a story your daddy told you at bedtime. I couldn't think of any that my dad did. In fact, it was mostly my mother and my sister reading me bedtime stories. My dad probably did. Um, so I said, well, why don't I give you a story about Papa? So every night we would alternate a Papa story or a grandma story uh, with a bedtime story. And so she got that oral tradition, that family history from an early age. And she was still into it so much. By the time she was 11, she helped um, for one of the genealogy conferences came to Boston in 2006. Um, she was got the youth award because she helped found a little youth group for kids. I mean, it didn't last for a long time, but she really enjoyed meeting people and genealogists. And uh, she loved teaching kids about genealogy. And right now she's a school teacher. Uh, and I'm very proud of her. And she's still knows the stories, um, she recognizes the pictures. So I'm not in fear, my stuff is gonna get tossed out. At American Ancestors, we've worked really closely with a lot of different youth groups with our youth education, whether it be scout groups or students that are being brought into a classroom um, that are being taught genealogy as a particular unit or even an entire course on it. And that's what I think really brings it more to the forefront of how important it is because what we do is we ask them to start researching their families and we help them understand that whether you have a notable ancestor all the way back in your line whether they go back to the mayflower or someone that served in the revolutionary war that your ancestor's place uh, was important in history and I remember one time I was working with one young student that seemed a bit despondent that he wasn't finding a notable in his tree like his classmates were. But we were able to go over and spend a little more time together and I helped show him that, you know, he his uh, ancestor was actually the surveyor of the county at that time. And we showed him how he was coming up in all these different county histories and, you know, basically explained how how that role was still very important to the community. And I think that connected him more because by the end, he didn't seem as sad. He actually seemed more proud and, you know, and he did say a quiet thank you as he was leaving. And I think that that's the, the impact I think we can have on young, young people today is showing them that everybody's history and family history matters. And it's important to research them and to find out more about who you come from. 
absolutely. All right. Um, so let's see here. So I also was curious. Um, so I'm sure there are a lot of people out there with photos and family artifacts. Um, who and you know, I think in a lot of families, uh, different people might have received different items. Things can kind of get spread across the family. Um, so do you have any suggestions for sharing these items amongst family members or even keeping track of where they are? Um, Melanie, would you like to get us started on that one? Sure. So I've actually been gathering a lot of keepsakes amongst my family because um, I would always ask for over the years. I'm like, where are all these family heirlooms people are always talking about? Like, do we have anything? And they kept saying, no, not really. And then all of a sudden I started getting into my adulthood and I would have my parents or my aunt. They would send me these things that belong to my grandparents and my great grandparents. And I can kind of share a couple of things I have next to me, actually, to give you an idea. Um, for example, this here is actually a painting out of she disappeared. Oops. Oh. There you go. This yep, is a, there this, it is. <laughs> this is actually a wood carving of a rose that my great grandfather, um, Eddie Gale, had actually um, made. And my grandmother has a corresponding one. I just got this a few years ago. So it was really lovely. And it even has his signature at the bottom here, which is really cool. Um, I also have things like, um, like, you know, like things like, you know, like, I guess like creamers or things like the like dishes like this, this also belongs to one of my great grandmothers. Um, you know, I've all just left lots of different, you know, things that, that I've just been acquiring over time that I never knew existed. And I think the best way you can do it is one, don't hide it away. First off, if you have something, put it out for display for the holidays, let people ask about it. Who, what is that from? Who had it before? Where did you get it from? And then I would say start maybe keeping track of that and maybe, you know, putting on index cards and noting where, you know, what information you have and keep that in a safe place so that when it comes down to if when someone passes, it doesn't end up in an estate sale or the dumpster. Like, let it get passed down to people that want them. And as descendants are really interested, I would say if they show interest in an item and you really have no interest or like my family, they were downsizing and moving you know, maybe pass it on to the next generation that would appreciate it. And that's something that I've been trying to do is I actually have like some of these keepsakes um, in a safe area on my dresser, but they're out for display so people can see them. You know, on Extreme Genes, we get this question all the time. The uh, Family History Radio Show and podcast I've been involved in in eight years, which actually just wrapped up this week uh, after 10 years of the show being on. But we get a lot of questions from viewers about what to do and uh scott fisher my co-host and dear friend had a really great idea and i'm actually my new year's resolution is to start one of these is to go around and photograph your family heirlooms i mean not just the photographs but the you know the china the particular like maybe a sword somebody had or the pair of glasses or belong to your great great grandmother and because otherwise, when we're gone, that's just stuff. And one of the ways that you can start to do this is put notes, like Melanie said, with the actual item. Give it the provenance. You know, when you go to a museum, you look at an artifact, you get really annoyed when you don't find a, well, who made it? Where is it from? How old is it? Think of your descendants the same way, or your family members are going to inherit this. You need to have the story. Otherwise, it becomes eBay fodder. In, or it's given away to a flea market or yeah. So I can remember when my aunt died. Um, I was very sad that it was a very bad winter storm when they were cleaning out her house. She had no children. I received some photographs, but I knew of a candy dish she got in her wedding in 1944 that was given to her by my great uncle. And I have nothing that belonged to him. And that would have been so wonderful to have that and pass it on to my children. But it's lost now to hit to time and history. Um, so one of the things Scott advises is that you take pictures of all the things and then you make up one of those photo books. So you have the photo on one side and then you have a caption with the history. And then you may even go to the point of saying, this is located in the China cupboard. This is located in a box in the attic marked, you know, grandpa's stuff. Just so you have sort of a treasure map, if you will, because when we're gone, we can't pass on this information. And it gets lost. So that's one way of doing it. 
Yeah, I love that. I I know that's something we struggle with in my big Irish Catholic family with lots of people who have different items. So that is, I love that suggestion. Um, well, moving on. So, so far we've talked a lot about how to kind of engage family members in the research we're doing. Um, but now let's talk about how they can help us so that we don't have to do all the work. Um, so uh, what are your suggestions for dividing research among family members um, and kind of staying organized while doing that? Um, David, would you like to get us started with this one? Yeah, I mean, one of the problems with um, stories that sometimes we can't find the facts. And I like to say fact checking is something you really need to do, but there's another way of doing this. So we have a grandparent that we heard a story from. We heard a version of it when we were little. So when you're writing your genealogy and you've got all your vital records and all your primary sources, you don't wanna forget these stories that you can't back up because there may be an ounce of truth in it. So write the story down and when you footnote it, write down that the person who is the source was your grandmother or your grandfather who told you this story in 1979 while you were visiting them. And then I want you to go one more step further. Other cousins may have heard the same story but with a different twist on it. Ask them what their version of the story is. And then you get this whole paragraph now of about five or six different, slight different variations. Case in point, my great grandfather was on a whaling ship. My mother's cousin told me that he was on the uh, Charles W. Morgan out of Mystic, Connecticut, and that he carved his name into the floorboard of the ship, and you can still see it today. Well, I saw the passenger, not the passenger, the crew list that my great grandfather was on. He was a ship called the Corsair, which sunk off the coast of Valparaiso, Chile, and he made it on board to another ship, and they all survived. But I'm like, if he carved his name on it, there, my cousin couldn't have seen this. So <laughs> I, I put the story down because somebody may have heard it and say, this is incorrect. So as the family historian, so the future generations don't get the stories wrong, you have the right to correct, sorry, grandma, the history. I think that dividing up some of the tasks can help a lot. So something that really evolved out of the pandemic was we all got really comfortable with using Zoom. And I connected with a lot of distant cousins on my Clerken Clerken line, and we will have Zooms like once a quarter or so to, you know, talk about what's new. And also, well, we're trying to figure out how we're um, all connected because apparently I'm the missing link in their in their line. So, and so some things we think about is just like, you know, you know, have we looked at this source or have we interviewed this person or things like that? And I could find that could be kind of a fun way to, you know, to think about how can we brainstorm and what can people bring together? So, and, you know, and, and dividing up into smaller tasks may make it a lot less cumbersome than saying like, okay, you need to do 40 hours of deed research tonight. Like that's not realistic. Like let's let, let's make smaller chunks at a time, and then you know I think as you bring more people in and you get them interested in a mystery, then I think you get more volunteers to, to help you with that. So, but I think maybe engaging them on a video call first would be a good way to start maybe to think about like, hey, maybe there's something we can look into together. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, you both uh, kind of referenced their interviewing family members. Um, so I am curious, uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about your strategies for interviewing family members? What questions should be asked? Um, Rhonda, maybe you want to uh, get us started with that one? Uh, sure. So I found that, uh, you know, when it comes to interviewing, you know, a lot of, a lot of what I call baby genealogists, and I was one once, uh, think, you know, we need to, we need to ask when was so-and-so born and when was this and when was that. And, and for our average individual, the dates of things are not necessarily like superimposed in their brains. And so I have found over time that if instead I ask about major events, uh, like when my grandparents had their 50th anniversary and the whole family was there. And so it's a little easier to say, oh yeah, I remember so-and-so was there. And then you say something like, well, do you remember about how old they were? And you may not get an exact date, but you get something that you can work with on that rather than 
kind of grilling them as though they're in the police station with the bare bulb, you know, over their head. And they're like, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. Because that's often the answer you get when you say, I want to ask you about the family history. I don't know anything. And so if you can broach it in this way of events that they were at and that they'll remember, you'll find that they actually do remember a lot more than, you know, they thought they did. And it's also sometimes a great way to talk to the older generation, especially who you may be as, as you know, a younger person, you may feel uncomfortable with. Like, what do I talk to them about? Um, I had a gentleman who had attended a getting started in genealogy uh, class that we gave one time at the society. And uh, we talked about, you know, talking to your relatives. And he came back to me like the next week. And he's like, I have to thank you. He says, my mom's in, you know, a, a nursing home. He's like, and I always, I always go visit her, but I don't know what to talk about with her. He said, and so this time I went and I asked her about, you know, like her graduation or something. He says, and now, like, we just go and I just let her talk. And, you know, so it was, he no longer felt awkward when he was, you know, there to see her because now he had a way of keeping the conversation going. When I was down visiting my family uh, recently, one of the things I did was I paid very close attention to a photo collage that my grandmother put together. And it was different photos of the family, her parents, um, you know, me, me, even me is when I was younger and everything. And I would start to ask her like, you know, information about some of the different uh, people that I saw in the photos, what was happening then. And she would share about some of the jobs she had as um, like working as a model for some things and or doing roller skating and all these other things, you know, and then I um, also made sure I took a, a snapshot of one of the photos. This is actually my great grandmother. So I had another photo of her, but this was, that was a really lovely one. And she has like a brooch on actually that we think that, you know, might be maybe a person in there. So it just started, we can open up a little more memories here. And I actually share this, these kind of photos in a family group I have on this line, of, on this line where they have other photographs of the other sisters of hers that they're descended from. And they would share about like how like, oh, yeah, this person was totally a fashionista and they would wear all these, you know, fun things. And here's this funky mirror picture they have where it looks like there's like three clones of her just based on the shadows and everything. Um, so that could be just a way to sort of start opening a conversation is maybe starting with a photograph and asking, you know, tell me about this. What was happening now? Um, who is in the photo? Do you know approximately, you know, what, you know, like if you don't, we don't know a year, what was happening around that time? Was it around so-and-so's wedding or, you know, this person's birth or. Great. I love that. I know, um, that's been really helpful in my own experience. Um, I'm lucky that my uncle has digitized a lot of our old family photos um, and it's prompted so many great stories from my mom about you know, playing with her siblings and um, exactly what you were describing, kind of pointing out different family members in the photos. And um, yeah, so that's a great strategy. Um, I also, on the topic of interviewing, I am just gonna pop in the chat. Um, we do have a couple of resources um, in the tools section of our website, um, sample interview sections, um, interview questions, I should say, and a questionnaire. So I'm just gonna pop those in there in case that's helpful for anybody. All right, um, and so moving on a little bit. So on the topic of kind of, you know, talking with family members, um, there are of course, you know, difficult topics that you might wanna bring up and discuss. Um, for example, wartime experiences, or maybe even something like a non-paternal event that comes up through a DNA test. Um, so how would you recommend kind of broaching those more difficult topics? Um, David, maybe you'd like to take this one um, sure. to start. Well, I, I I love talking to veterans. Um, from the time I was a kid, I was corresponding and writing letters to Spanish-American war veterans and World War One veterans. And then, um, I would say about 23 years ago, I had a small cable show locally. And um, one of our World War II veterans wanted to get the stories out and he asked me, would I do it? And I said, sure. So we did about 20 or 30 episodes and we did World War II, Korea, Vietnam. And I always, always felt that no one should feel like they're on the spot. Um, there was a couple of gentlemen that were at Iwo Jima 
And, you know, and I know that they suffer from PTSD from this, even 50 years later, 60 years later. And I said, before the camera started rolling, I said, if there's anything you don't want to talk about, just let me know right now. And I, I gave him the list of questions ahead of time. I said, just read through these. If you don't want to, if you want to pass over this or you don't want to answer this and maybe he does, that's fine. Um, like for Iwo Jima, I mean, there was one of the gentlemen who knows that he had 27 confirmed kills. And, you know, he told me that off camera and it said that haunted him for his whole life. And when it came to that, he had an answer. He says, we were soldiers. We did what we had to do. And, you know, it's, so you want to hear the history. You don't want to forget it. You almost want to hope that when the camera, especially if it's a family member, when the camera's off, especially with military stories, maybe you don't get it recorded. Maybe you don't get it on videotape, but write it down because everything is important. I mean, how amazing would it be if we knew interviews with our Civil War ancestors or our Revolutionary War? And partly we have that in a way because the narratives and the petitions for their pensions kind of give us some of that insight. But for the living veterans now, we have less than 120,000 World War II veterans. And we have, you know, Korea, Vietnam being the next rank of older veterans. We got to get these stories or they're going to be lost. The fire in 73 in St. Louis, Missouri, lost so many of the personnel records for um, the U.S. Army and the uh, Army Air Corps and the Air Force that we're going to be piecing together these stories. So the next time a veteran tells you something, especially a family member who's a vet, listen. And write it down. Well, I can tell you what not to do when it comes to finding something uh, surprising. And uh, in my instance, in my defense, I didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal. Uh, so I had been researching uh, my third great grandfather, Benjamin Stander, for, for like ever. And the man avoided like every revenue he could find. And so, so it wasn't in the censuses and whatnot. Well, I discovered that uh, the first record I had for him was that he, the governor of Illinois was requesting from the governor of Iowa his return. I'm here to tell you, if you find that, that's never good. Uh, he actually had been arrested. He jumped bail. He ran off to Iowa. He was brought back. Uh, and he ended up spending like two and a half years in jail for stealing $11, which was grand larceny at the time. Uh, and so I had found this great, you know, information and a cousin was going to be in Illinois. And so he's like, you know, I'm going to look for the, the actual court case, uh, all the details. He's like, what else can I look for? I said, well, he was married at the time. I'm like, look for a divorce from his wife. I'm sure she didn't wait around for him. And sure enough, he went and he, you know, contacted me and he says, well, I found a divorce, but it's not for Jane, who was the wife that that his first wife. It was for his second wife, Patsy. And in the age of lack of no fault divorces, you know, she had to go and petition and like air all the dirty laundry. And basically what he had done is he had abandoned her for a year, uh, made her sell off her dower right for some land, took it and went to a whole other state. He went to Nebraska, uh, supposedly to get them a better start. And then he came back a year later. She'd had his child while he was away. And instead of moving back in with, with uh, Patsy there, he moved in with another woman right in the same town. And so I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, this is great. Like, I've got tons of paperwork on him. So I tell my mother, I'm like, you're never going to believe what I found. And I tell her all these cool things that I found out about Benjamin. And she went nuts. And I'm like... Mom, why are you so upset? It's not even on your side of the family. It's on dad's. It's just, like, well, I always knew that side of the family was bad. But it was just like, I never expected her reaction to that because it wasn't even like in her bloodline. It's in mine. So yeah, you may want to temper your enthusiasm when you find those, you know, black sheep in the family. When it comes to things like a non-paternal event, especially as, you know, DNA testing is becoming more, more popular and many people are, are doing that testing and have already probably tested with at least one company, 
it is very tempting a lot of times to ask a family member about a non-paternity event, a possible adoption, another, a, few, um, a child out there, all kinds of scenarios. Um, obviously, there could be a lot of trauma that could be brought up with this. So one, you always want to proceed very gently and privately with the person that you're interested in doing. Don't have a larger audience with a lot of other people because they're more likely to say, nope, not our family and clam up and that's it. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times, most people will usually discover what actually happened after the person of interest is deceased, which does happen. So most people will actually wait until maybe their parents or grandparents are gone before they start looking into that side of the family. Um, and that is a way to kind of, like you said, to kind of respect the dead and to say like, okay, I'll look into it, you know, after you're gone and this way, not causing you that pain. So there could be, a, you might think about potentially, you know, waiting to kind of open that up to others. Um, and, you know, maybe test the waters with other family members, but um, it, it really depends. Every family is going to be very different with how they process different things. I will say that if family members come to you and say, I think I have something that I want to investigate, then you can definitely offer your experience and say, well, we could use, you know, XYZ testing to maybe look into this. And then that's a way of at least bringing them into it and be more of a partnership um, instead of trying to look like you're digging up the skeletons. Definitely. Um, and kind of on this topic of DNA, um, do you have additional recommendations for kind of approaching family members to ask them to take DNA tests? Because um, I know sometimes that can be a little tricky. Um, David, I think I'll start with you. And then Melanie, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on this as well as kind of our resident DNA expert. Well, the ones I try to approach are the ones that are interested, first off. And then when there's a sale with Ancestry or 23andMe or, you know, Family Tree DNA, I buy some extra kits. Or if I win one in a contest, or if I'm lucky, I kind of put those away. And then if I look at the shelf life for them, I find that interested family member. Because what I'm trying to determine are the DNA of ancestors that I don't have like the signature DNA. So like my grandfather's mother was a pike and uh, there's no pike DNA. I have the autosomal DNA. So I find a living male pike from my great grandmother's uh, brother's side. Say, hi, would you like a DNA test on me to get the Y DNA done? Uh, or if I want to get a further, you know, further insight into a family, or if I suspect there's a non-paternity event, I will uh, send a test. And you know, if, uh, this is a non-paternity event; it could have happened 200 years ago, 100 years ago. I'm not trying to, you know, find out if this person's parents are correct. Um, I will send them out, and I'll share the information. I'll be upfront and say, hey, "Listen, I suspect that maybe our great grandfather isn't our great grandfather. You're the key." Um, and I'm sure Melanie can talk more about what type of tests that people are want to to send because they're not all the same. Yeah, and you bring up a good point. I, I've done that too, where I've actually sent some ancestry kits to relatives in hopes that they take the test. I didn't even ask some of them actually. I but they but they'd express some interest. I will say that, like my aunt, for example. I had told her about when I took the 23andMe test and I'm like, oh, I'm this much percentage, you know, Neanderthal DNA. And she's like, that's so cool. I want to know how I can do that. You know, and then she took it on her own, the 23andMe. And then I was like, okay, sent her an ancestry kit ne next year. I was, I was figured she took one. That's a start. So sometimes you can just do the luck of the draw of maybe sending out an autosomal, like an ancestry test and saying like, hey, you might be interested to take it. It's on me. Here you go. Um, and you might get lucky and then someone will take it though. However, you know, you, if you do want to, you know, approach people and take their temperature and see if they're willing to do the testing first, um, you know, then you, then you might want to think about, well, okay, maybe they're not interested in autosomal DNA because that's going to bring up too many, you know, close relatives. They don't want, they're not interested in the matches. Maybe they're interested in doing more of the specialized tests like David was talking about. So looking for living, living males to take a Y DNA test or um, testing different people for their mitochondrial, for their maternal line, whether they're male or female. So, I mean, I mean, that could be another possibility too, if you can bring them in again into that mystery of like, hey, maybe we can figure out where our line goes back to, you know, no one's figured it out yet. Genealogists have been stumped. Let's do it. Let's do this test and see what happens. Did that with my dad and he took it too. So he's like, okay, 
you know, I mean, it makes it a lot easier when you pay the bill. So I'll say that. So, I mean, that's kind of the first hurdle, I think. I think if you can at least, you know, pay the cost, you know, great. Um, but yeah, I'd say definitely, you know, try to interest people into general history, um, you know, see how they're reacting to family history. And I think then if they're expressing interest of it and then, yeah, you might be able to take the gamble and just get them a test when the when the prices come down and hope for the best. Sounds good. All right. Well, um, we have time for just about one more question before we move on to the audience questions. Um, for those of you out there, um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. Um, but before we do that, um, you know, I know we're all in the holiday season. A lot of us are seeing family. Um, so as we're gathering around kind of our holiday tables, um, what is a question that you think would be good to ask all members of the family? not necessarily just the older generation, but things that could even include younger generations, kids as well, um, if you have thoughts on that. Um, Rhonda, if you'd like to start us off. Um, for myself, I think that uh, the question that that I guess I think is a good one is what, you know, everybody's like hindsight's twenty twenty, and we often are judging our ancestors and everything. And so for me, it's more of a, well, what do I want to be remembered for? What do you want to be remembered for, you know, from your descendants, you know, those in the future? And you know, I also think that, that in addition to it kind of focusing the person on like what they want to be remembered for, I also think that it has like a benefit of the you know, the idea of, well, I want to be remembered as a good person. And, you know, so maybe there's, you know, kind of that, that additional bonus of maybe they'll, if, if they are not necessarily a good person, maybe they will think, oh, people are going to remember me for this and I don't want to be remembered for that. Uh, you know, but it, and then I think it does also temper that judgment of our ancestors, uh, you know, because we're looking at it in 21st century mentality and that's not what they had then. So that I think is my big one. Melanie, how about you? I would say probably thinking about earliest memory would definitely be a question I would want to know more about. I think that a lot of us have very early memories that really stick with us for a long time. And I think that those are the ones that we might be least likely to pass on and, you know, and actually remember sometimes too, if it's not a very notable, notable thing as well. I mean, I, I can even remember very early days when I was a child um, being like literally in the crib and all that. And my parents used to call me Rocky Ricky because I used to headbang against the crib all the time. And I was, and I wasn't into metal music or anything like that. But it's just a fun memory. I just, I do remember being in the crib, like, just like, you know, probably, you know, trying to, trying to mouth mom, mom, like, you know, pick me up, you know, or something, you know, and it's just, I think we can just get kind of like, you know, really interesting kind of like stories. And I wonder about, especially for a lot of our immigrant, um, you know, ancestors that have came over, what would their earliest memory have been? Is there a memory back in the old country they remember or things like that? I feel like that's the kind of thing that we would really stick with us for a while and we'd be keep more curious about passing on. I love that. Um, David, if you'd like to finish yeah. with something that we should ask around the holiday table. Well, you know, one of the things we, we concentrate as genealogists on names and dates, and then going back to the simplest form of a question, how did you meet your spouse? Where did you meet them? Was it a blind date? Um, you, know, we, you know, did you not like them at first? Did you know them from school? Getting the background other than just date of marriage, uh, or Betty, where did you get engaged? You know, I know that story of my parents. And luckily, because I was a young genealogist, I know that story of my grandparents. I can suspect how my great-grandparents met. I know that my great-grandfather and great-grandmother in the 1864 Boston City Directory are living across the street from each other as teenagers. So that's just probably how they met. But Imagine how easy it would be if we wrote this down and interviewed aunts and uncles and just kept a journal of something, just something as simple as that. Where you went to school? What was your first job? Um, how much did you make an hour? You know, I mean, that's the thing that would get the kids interested. You made a dollar fifty an hour. You know, I mean, <laughs> things like that. They're just, you know, 
you know, what's what did you want to be when you were a kid? When you wanted to grow, when you were a kid growing up, did you want to be a fireman or a nurse or whatever? I mean, an astronaut. Uh, getting these stories down adds a human interest, and we're more than just that dash on the gravestone. We become, you know, something that's a story, and we become part of history that way. Great. Well, I think that's a great place um, to end for now before we head into audience questions. Um, and before we do that, I did also just want to pop um, a, one more link into the chat. Um, we do have um, gift memberships available as we're talking about the holiday table and things like that. Um, and that is a great way to get uh, your family interested in family history as well. Um, so I'm going to pop that in the chat. And um, let's turn to some of the questions that have been coming in here. Um, so first we have a question here uh, from Stephanie who's wondering, how do I handle family members who don't want to share their research that they're working on? Um, any suggestions for that? I mean, I personally, I've had that happen in the past and that there's not a whole lot you can do. The harder you push, the harder they're going to push back. Uh, so usually, you know, and especially now with many things being on the internet, um, you know, see if there's a way that you can do it yourself. In some instances, it has more to do also with the cost, because back in the dark ages, when we were doing a lot of this, you know, we were having to, uh, you know, write to various courthouses and pay, you know, money for the various records and things. And so it could be more of a cost. Thing where they're like, well, I spent, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars doing this. I'm not going to just give it to you. Uh, you know, maybe try and ask about a specific record that you're struggling to find and see if maybe they'll share that with you. Uh, I've found that if you can get a dialogue going uh, and they see that you're willing to share as well, sometimes that'll help. You know, I've had some relatives that, you know, just to get genealogical information from them. So how I bait the hook is I send them everything I have on a particular relative. And then I put something in there that I'm not so sure about and they're gonna know and they're gonna set the story straight because they're gonna wanna correct you. And that's why you get the answer back sometimes. So that's what, that works for me occasionally. Uh, and kind of building off this question, a sort of similar question as well. Um, someone's wondering, how do you, uh, how would you handle family members who say what you've researched isn't correct? Um, especially if maybe you're uncovering some, you know, more difficult things. Um, we have reference to the kind of a criminal record here, things like that. Um, how, how would you uh, handle that? I think I would just start by asking them to maybe like not getting defensive just asking like okay can you help set the record straight like what what particular fact is not correct like can you help me understand where were they living instead wh what was happening then you know have you found something that you know you, you can share with me or like you know like David like you mentioned if you kind of share almost summary of what you already have maybe you, you can show your logic too if you want to but maybe it's just as simple as just saying okay great tell me where were they said, you know, and I'll be happy to correct my information, you know, so. Yeah, for me, I find that sometimes if it is sort of like a black sheep kind of situation, uh, you know, to just kind of, you know, kind of soften the blow and say, look, it doesn't change who you and I are today. You know, this person had their struggles and, you know, what happened to them happened and, but, you know, you and I are still the same as we were before I found this information. And sometimes, you know, for them, it's it's more of that tarnishing of the family. And if they realize that, you know, it happened a while back or, you know, you're still who you are, it, it makes it a little easier. I've also found people that have online trees that will, like, especially in ones that like family search where they can correct it. They connected my grandmother's late husband, who died when he was 24, to another family who had seven kids, and he was alive till 1972. And I knew fully well he died in 1921, so he wasn't a bigamist and didn't run away. So reaching out to the people with the facts, just so they'll correct it on their end, so there's no misinformation. So it doesn't even have to be a near relative. It could be somebody who's far-reaching in your research that you stumble across a tree. 
uh, and just you know supply the information and you know hopefully they're they're logical enough to understand that you've got the facts and if they get facts and dispute it great they'll share it maybe they'll stand me corrected great thank you um, we also have a question here from John, who's wondering, uh, have any of the panelists tried to connect the genealogical pedigrees with the ancestral homelands and towns and certain historical events? Um, I'm finding more fascination from family members when you can make these connections. That's any thoughts on that? I can, well, uh, it's, it kind of ties in also with children. Uh, my daughter had a they were in school she has a twin sister and they were learning you know they were reading the little house on the prairie books and they had to do a special like project and uh jessica had her project all lined up and she's super excited and elizabeth was very very despondent because she hadn't come up with a project and figured that her sisters was gonna you know was was super cool and there's nothing she could do and i said well would it help if i told you that you were related to Eliz uh, you know to the the author of the you know of the books and she was like we are and so her project became how she was related and so again just instilling that that kind of interest in the the genealogy and i think that can be true of adults too we want to like find cool things or or you know anything stories that make things more interesting than just again the as as i call them the begats the birth marriages and deaths and so that also can help you know one of the things that i i'm sorry melanie please I, sorry i remember my excitement when i had actually located um a pair of some of my ancestors um in actually a published book and so my family is very rarely written about because a lot of them are immigrants uh, from ireland or from eastern europe and they actually were put in a, a small ch small section um, by for exiles and islanders by Dr. Brendan O'Grady, um, talking about the people that came from Ireland to Prince Edward Island. And they had actually my Rooney line actually came over um, on one of the one of the only coffin ships that actually uh, arrived in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. So, because a lot of the family had always kind of wondered, like, oh, we all came over like after the famine, and it's like mm, not so much. A lot of them came over a little later, actually, um, or they all went to Canada first, and that was actually the one one line I really could definitively show that, like, yeah, they were on the poorer side of the family. And actually, did come over on what one of the, what they called the coffin ships because so many people died on the disease and all the other exposure and lack of nutrition on there. While everybody else was com comfortably coming over, I would say on other ships from Ireland with more members of the congregation, they had more funds available, and things were just a lot easier. So I, I found that that was a way to kind of tie it into some history, showing that I did have people going back to the famine. And on another line, I even found that my third great grandfather, his son, actually left Prince Edward Island and went to Kansas because I had lost track of him. And his father, my third great grandfather, followed him. And his son went to Kansas because he decided to participate with the Homestead Act. So that was another piece of American history I was able to actually tie to as well. And in, in addition, is that I was able to show, okay, here's now people actually leaving, you know, to America to actually participate in getting that public land from the government. And I think like, you know, when we can tie those pieces of history together, you're right, it does make for a lot more interesting story and it's easier to pass down and it lets you see how your family can be, um, can be a part of history as well. You know, one of the things with the stories, um, you know, sometimes the stories get twisted. And again, that's why it's great to get different variations. So uh, one of my second cousin's kids came up and said, our relative came over on the Titanic. And I'm like, well, no. So that's not true. Uh, and they're like, well, I heard this story. And what the story was, they had been, I think I may have told their grandparent that got it twisted, is that our great grandfather came over on a went over and came back on a troop ship which was the rms olympic the sister ship to the titanic but you can see how in just two generations how a story can be swapped over so again setting the story straight but it is fun to find those historical connections like my wife and i both share a 10th great grandmother 
who was an accused um, Salem witch. And so, so my kids were fascinated by that. So find that fascination. Like for me, it was the whaling story and connecting to history that way. Not exactly a romantic part of history, you know, hunting whales, but for me, it was enough to catch me an interest in what I'm doing now. Um, on the point of the Titanic story, similar in my family, my great grandmother came over on the Teutonic, but would always tell my mom that it was the Titanic. <laughs> so <laughs> thankfully, there was always somebody there to correct her. But <laughs> um, all right, we have some great questions coming in here. Um, another one, um, do you have recommendations for organizing information that an older relative has already compiled throughout the years? Um, but, you know, they have stories on slips of paper, it's unorganized. Um, any tips for that? So when I first got into genealogy, uh, I actually did inherit uh, all of my grandmother's research. Uh, she had joined the DAR and tried to join uh, Mayflower Society. She never got in there. She only got as far as Plymouth. But my grandfather, after she passed, he started mailing me all of these papers and every family tidbit he had, the mailman hated me because uh, these big boxes would arrive. And so what I started to do was to basically arrange things in folders uh, and putting the, the, I always did it by the name of the husband of the couple on my pedigree chart, my multi-generational chart, because that at least gave me a roadmap for everything. And so if they were a kid of that family, you know, it went in there and then slowly but surely I've, I've been, I started to digitize those and uh, create folders on my hard drive for that as well. So that I always have everything kind of in the same way so that I can easily find it. I've been embracing a lot of the newer technologies as part of inherited research. So a lot of times I've had some distant cousins um, that were even former clergy that had passed down different family manuscripts that were being done. So I was actually been reviewing a lot of the research that's been done, updating it, and trying to pass it on in a new format. So whether it's my own personal blog or even adding things like to Instagram, and I saw there was a question in the chat, I've even been adding it to TikTok as well. Um, just to kind of bring it to a newer audience and make it fun and just make it kind of short and sweet in a way, you know, so if I'll either share like one story about an ancestor or here's one photograph or, and just give like a tidbit out there and it's a way to kind of, you know, share it out and to be honest, it's really great cousin bait. That's what we call it because people can quick can find this stuff through doing a Google search or something and come across it. And I can't tell you how many times I've actually come across newer cousins because of this. And you never know what, what they might have for you. So I think embracing the newer technologies to share that disseminated research is a way to keep it alive in a way, especially if we never write what we call the big book of genealogy in our family. You know, it's funny. Um, I've received some collections like that. And before you want to tear into it, transcribe it and put it in a different format and just get rid of those notes, photograph it. The archivist training from work when I worked at the state archives when we were just microfilming images, not just digital cameras, what we do now, before we tear into a collection, we'd get the original order because there may be some sense to that. Those file folders were put together for a reason, unless it's a big jumble in a box. But even art, like an archeologist, the layers may mean something. So try to keep that original order together then you have them scanned, then you can do what you want with them. Uh, and please, please don't get rid of the original notes because you may realize that you forgot to do the backside of a page or something didn't mean anything to you and you didn't write it down. And you're going to kick yourself years later like, oh, I thought I got those all scanned, but I threw them away. So. All right. Well, thank you all so much. I'm looking at the clock. I see we're just about out of time. Um, so I think we'll leave it there. Um, however, I did just want to mention a lot of you have been sending in some great suggestions of ways that you've gotten your family interested in family history. Um, I just wanted to share one that was a particular favorite of mine. Um, somebody, uh, their family created a bingo card at a family reunion where the questions um, for sorry, let me get this right. The questions are from our family history and the answers are provided on the bingo grids. So then I think the questions were called out and then you'd kind of place the 
point on the answer. Um, so I just loved that suggestion. And thank you all for writing in your suggestions. I've had a lot of fun reading through those. Um, and thank you very much to our panelists. It's been a lot of fun talking with you all and hearing your thoughts on this. Um, I'm just going to get up my uh, closing slides here. So bear with me just one second. All right, so um, I did just wanna let you know about a few of our upcoming events. Um, so first we have a free webinar coming up on Thursday this week, What's New at American Ancestors? This will be presented by our Vice President for Digital Strategy, Claire Vale. Um, and then moving into the new year, on Wednesdays in January, we're offering a five-week online seminar on researching American Revolutionary War patriots. David and Melanie will be among the presenters for that, along with Jonathan Hill and Elizabeth P. Uh, and finally, we're having a three-day genealogical skills boot camp. January 18th, 19th, and 20th. Um, Rhonda will be among the presenters for that as well. Um, this is a great way to start your research for the new year. Um, and I am happy to share that we're offering an early bird discount for this one. So if you do register before December 31st, you will receive 50% off the registration cost. And if you're a member, you'll still get your 10% off on top of that. Um, so it's a really great savings. Um, and I definitely recommend checking that one out. Um, again, great way to kind of kickstart your research in the new year. You can learn more about these and all of our upcoming events at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. Thank you again for joining us today, and you will have an opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback on today's panel. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any feedback is very helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of our members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to help keep, keep these programs free and to create more. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org education. Thank you again, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.